It's always interesting to look out and see all the young minds leave. <laughs> We've been going through a series on Joseph. If you remember, we're on part five, and it's today is actually a second part of the one we did last week. If you remember last week, we were talking about God's will, God's way, and God's time. And so often we try to do it. <clears throat> we may know God's will. Remember, God's will was revealed to Joseph in Genesis 37, talking about the two dreams. And he then, remember, told it to his brothers. And uh, But anyway, he, he knew the dream. But right now we find him in prison. And you stop and think about it then. One of the dangers when we have, we know what God wants, is taking matters into our own hands. You see it throughout the scripture. Abraham tried to take matters into his own hands. Isaac did. Uh, we find it also that the, in Genesis 37, Judah and his brothers, remember, took matters in their own hands and sold him. And remember their answer in verse 20, well, what's going to happen to his dreams now? How many of you ever tried to change God's plans? Just one. I'm not going to lose. Lisa, 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 we're on the same page. You know, Moses did too. Remember in Acts chapter 7, he knew that he was uh, going to be the leader to take them out, and he tried to kill the Egyptian, remember? And he was in the backside of the desert for 40 years, basically, God working on him. You have with Tamar, the matters in her own hands in chapter 38. So we also remember saw the dungeons of possibilities, what keeps us off of the path when we're going through difficult times and keeps us from realizing God's will and his dreams. You remember? You had one, there's basically a four of them. Under, you undergo uh, uh, undeserved treatment. Did Joseph get some undeserved treatment? Did Job, humanly speaking, get undeserved treatment? He had the unexpected restrictions. Well, Joseph, one minute's free, the next minute, what is he? Okay, did, did Job get some unrestricted things too? With the boils and everything else, he wasn't just you know, able to do it. You have uh, untrue accusations. Did uh, Job's friends accuse him falsely? Did Joseph, in Joseph's case, did he get accused falsely by Potiphar's wife? He also had unfair abandonment. Was Job abandoned? What happened to his wife? And what happened to his friends? Was Joseph abandoned? So think about it. You have it in the middle of it. But then you have the development in God's furnace. We saw last week how God was developing in, in the furnace. You remember in Potiphar's house? And you have two things there. Three times in chapter 39, it says God was with him. You think about how is God with you when you're sitting there and you're a slave and you rise up in Potiphar's house and you remember you're falsely accused and now you're in prison and according to Psalms, you're in fetters and chains. But twice while he's in prison, if you notice in uh, 39 at the end, it says God was with him. Joseph does what he should do and is faithful. And God is with him during it. So you think about it, you also have the development. God is developing. You know, how did, was Joseph able to know how to direct people when he finally does get promoted? Because he had been doing it for 13 years. He'd been overseeing people. So even though it may not look like you're preparing, how would you like to be over prisoners? You think that might have been an interesting group to try to uh, be over? Or over Potiphar's wife? A uh, house rather than his wife over his house? <laughs> no, what? <So> Brodian slip. <laughs> you have the, the decisions too that you have. Remember he had two decisions. Remember, it's interesting, he said, I cannot do this because it's sin against God. I think it's interesting because there's no one in the house. So often we don't do things because we're afraid of being caught. But he wouldn't have been caught then. But he didn't do it because sin against God. The second thing which was really fit well with what Bill had to talk about in First Peter, the second reason is because suffering for others. How many times do we realize we're made to go through things because we're suffering for others? If Joseph hadn't gone through all these different things, would he have been in a position then to save his family? So now obviously God didn't reveal those things to him. We are told we are suffering so often in life in order to help somebody else down the road. So think about it. We have it. So today, think about the part two. We're in chapter 40 and 41. And just, if you would, turn over to Job 23. Because I think Job 23 does a real good job of kind of showing us a little bit about it. You remember Job's friends are coming up to him. And obviously he's lost. Job speaking now has lost everything. And... Uh, 
So you have him here. And in 23, he has a reply, but it's uh, hidden in here some very important things. First of all, and talk about the part that I want to dwell on today is the dross removal. Now, what is dross? Slag, okay, so you refine metals in order then to get the bad to the dross will rise and you'll get rid of it. You skim it off the top. How many of us want God to do that? He's refining us, correct? How many of you have gotten to the point where you think, I am fine and I'm ready, I'm pure, I don't need it anymore? Well, that's where you find Job is at in chapter 23, although at the end of the book he realizes there's some more to be taken off. But you notice, first of all, in the middle of the dross removal, when God's doing this and you're kind of in a tough place, in verse 3, notice to 5, and then also in verse 8 and verse 9, you feel like you're a disillusionment of danger of being disillusioned. Notice he says, Oh, I, <clears throat> that I knew where I might find you, that I might come to, to his seat. I present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I will lean, learn the words which he would answer and perceive what he would say. Can you go down a little further? What about in verse 8 and 9? Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive. When he acts to the left, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right, I cannot see him. Well, Job kind of wondering where God's at. He's wondering where God's at in the middle of all this. And he's obviously speaking <coughs> to his friend. But notice, this is where he thinks he is, but he's not. Notice what God's doing in verse 10. But he knows that I, the way I take, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Okay, so does uh, Job think that he has been refined and everything? Good. And that's what God's doing. He is refining us, but when you end to the end of the book, does Job change his mind when he does get an audience with God? So I think it's interesting. So the dross is being removed, even though at times we think we don't need any removed. How many of you think, God, you've been in the furnace long enough, you've got me hot enough, enough has come out, I don't need any more. And that's where Job is at. That's what God's doing. But notice the part that Job is still continuing to do in verse 10 and verse 11, or actually in verse 11 and 12. My foot is held fast to his path, I have kept his way and not turned aside. I've not departed from the commands of his lips. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than necessary food. In the middle of all this was Job still doing what he should be doing. He thought he'd been tried enough, but God still was trying him more. Now, go back to our story then in Joseph. Do you think Joseph feels like he's been tried enough? But what you're going to find, he's going to be in there at least two more years. Longer than that. I'm sure he's felt by this time, I hey, I have been tried enough. So let's look at it. Let's go back. We, we've seen Joe's example. Let's go look at Joseph's example. The background, you remember, in uh, chapter 39, he's uh, been thrown into prison uh, for doing what was right. Uh, according to Psalms, he's in fetters and chains. He rises to power in verse 21, and he's now over all the stuff going on in jail. And he's been there for some time. Chapter 40, then, you now have the two dreams, one by the cupbearer and then one by the baker. And the Pharaoh is furious with him. Now, why would Pharaoh be furious with the cupbearer or the cup uh, or the uh, baker? Why would they be such important parts? Okay, because obviously it's hard to get a military close enough to Pharaoh. But the easiest way to kill somebody in those days was through what they ate and what they drank. You could slip poison in real easy. So you wanted somebody truly trustworthy. So something happened. Now, was it just a whim or it was some type of poison put in and he doesn't know which one? It doesn't say. The text doesn't tell us. So they're both thrown in <coughs> prison. And who happens to be over them? Joseph does. Okay, so notice then in verse 4, they, at the end of verse 4, they're under Joseph's care and he takes care of them. And they were in confinement for some time. That's interesting. We don't tell how long that is. Remember from time he was sold, he was 17. The time he's exalted, according to the next chapter, he'll be uh, 30. So there's 17 years that's going to take place. Uh, or excuse me, 13 years it's going to take place. Uh, we know parts of it, so we can we just guess seven years at Potter's house and six years in the jail. Don't know for sure. 
So here he is. So he, this is the setting one. Notice the next day then, the cupbearer and the baker were in jail and they both had a drink. And notice what happens then in verse 6. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, why your face sad today? Now, that's amazing to me. If you were Joseph, what would your face be looking at? And how would you be looking at somebody else? Confinement for some time. Hey, buddy, I've been here five years before you ever got here. You know, I mean, you know, look what our answers to. He is concerned enough about them. He notices a difference in their countenance, and he cares enough to ask. Or as how many would be say, well, you think you got it tough. Hey, buddy, you know, how many just want to relate ours? So I think it's interesting. He notices it. That he notices they're dejected. He notices they disclosed the disclosure. And they said to him, we have a dream, and therefore no one can interpret it. And then notice Joseph. Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell it to me, please. Now, the last time he had a couple of dreams, what happened to him? Now, you know, it's interesting. How many of you would like to even talk about dreams if you're in Joseph's position? <laughs> hey, buddy, don't even mention dreams, you know. Let me tell you my story. None of that. You know, again, I think it's amazing. At his young age, he doesn't go into it. But notice what he has. And disclosure, he's going to interpret it. Then from verse 9 down to, uh, to 19, he's going to tell the, the opposite the cupbearer that in three days you're going to be restored. And then he tells the baker, in three days you're going to be killed and you're going to be, uh, going to be hung and uh, you're going to be left out there and the birds are going to eat you. Now, how would you like to be Joseph? How would you like to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Could you not tell the, the cupbearer the truth? And could you not have told the baker uh, everything's going to work out according to what God said? They're going to come up with something because, hey, by the time he finds out, he's hanging, right? But it's important to recognize because here in a few short period of time, it's going to be said he revealed both of our dreams exactly as it was said. So I think it's important. How many of us are willing to tell the God spokesman anywhere? and everywhere. And how many of us are willing to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? In our society today, how many people want to hear the truth of God's Word? You know, I noticed that Glenn probably talking about truth and things like that. How many people want to hear the truth? Does our society want to hear what the Word of God says? If I'm God's spokesman, I have to do what? I have to tell the truth. David, I mean, you think about Daniel, do you tell Nebuchadnezzar the truth? Yes. You tell Belshazzar the truth? Yes. So think about it here. He's telling them the truth. The dreams then are fulfilled in 20 to 23. And of course you remember uh, you know, on his birthday, Pharaoh's birthday, one's restored and one's not. But let me talk about what I talked about. You may not agree, but I think it's dross is being removed from Joseph's life. And I understand it because what happens in the next chapter, nothing of this is mentioned. But notice I'm going to talk about it. Look over in verse 14 and 15. After he tells the cupbearer the truth, notice what he says. Only keep in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of his house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of Hebrew, and even here I've done nothing that should be put me into the dungeon. Is that true? Is, is he trying to get out of the dungeon on his own? Okay, I think it's interesting. He, remember, he revealed the truth and didn't have any strings attached. Which whenever you find people, Daniel and West, telling the truth of what God has revealed, they refuse to take any payment. Elijah, same thing, because otherwise they don't want to think that you pay for it. It's free. God, same with our message. We give the message of Jesus Christ. It's free. We don't aren't doing it for payment. So notice, the reason I call this dross is because the next chapter. Because I think what's interesting, now again, I understand networking, and we're told to network, and that's what's going to get him out. But how of us try to make the networking work for us at the wrong time? Because of the networking, we try to get it done at the right time. If he had got out now, where would he be when Pharaoh had the dream? If Joseph had got out two years before, he would be off, he'd be on his own. How in the world would he have stayed here or would he have gone back home? 
And when Pharaoh had the dream, where would Joseph be and how could they get a hold of him? And so what he has to, Joseph has to come to the conclusion of what? I have to be willing to stay until God wants to get me out of here. And I have to be refined until God is ready to get me out of here. And so in our own lives, how many of us we could be like Job? Hey, I've already been refined. I'm going to be pure gold. No, nope, not yet. There's more testing to take place. So think about it when you look at a couple of questions. Am I willing to tell the whole truth no matter what? Am I willing to tell it anywhere and at any time? You just never know when you're going to be asked. So let's think about it. Here we have it. Now he's going to have the the, uh, dream. You think about this, what I like to call in chapter 41, the disclosure of gold. Look in chapter 41 and notice a change you have now in Joseph. Pharaoh has a dream in verse 1 down to verse 8. And we know that very well we have the two different ones about the ears. You remember you have the ear of corn coming out of it. Now you also have the, uh, or in the field, and it was eaten up by these small stalks, and then you have the, the uh, cattle coming out of the Nile, and then being eaten up by the lean ones. Obviously when it's hot, cattle, we find that here, when it gets hot in the summertime, where do the cows go? They go into the pond, cool off, and then they come up and they'll eat graze some more. And obviously, they don't know what's going on, and notice you have the magicians and the wise men, and the words there for dreams and so on, the wise men is actually the words, the experts in sacred scriptures. But they can't tell Pharaoh the meaning. Okay, so it's being set up. Pharaoh has a dream. It's too much interesting, too, when you find in the previous chapter, it says two full years later. <coughs> so think about it, Joseph. Well, am I getting out with the cupbearer? No hope. Two years later. He has a dream. So notice then, which you have the discovery then of Joseph, in 9 to 13, the chief cupbearer comes up and says, oh, uh, and he relates the story and tells how he and the baker had a dream and a Hebrew youth in prison told us the meaning. And it happened exactly for both of us, like he said. That's why it was important for Joseph to tell the baker the truth also. Exactly what he said. Now notice again, it's important why Joseph didn't get out before. Why? Where would he be in order to find him to tell the truth to get him out? Now it's interesting. So here you have it. Now remember, Joseph is, he doesn't know about this. Two years later, he still just going about his everyday activities, working, being faithful to what God has him to do, and God is also being with him. You think about it, in one day's time, in the morning you're over here serving and you're going to jail and you're faithful there to what happens then in 14. Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph. They hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. When he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. But if, you know, if you were going before Pharaoh, you had to be clean shaven and I'm sure that he wasn't. And I'm sure he had a shower recently too, right, with all the nice clothes. You think about it, in a matter of a couple hours, you're going from the dungeon to standing before the most powerful man on the earth. That's amazing to be a transit. And when Joseph woke up in the morning to go to work, does he know this is going to happen? How do you know when God is doing things in your life? You get up in the morning, you are to go about faithfully serving the Lord. You don't know what's going to happen. His whole world is going to change here shortly. Look at it then, so the Pharaoh then... It's interesting he's then going to uh, dream is going to be told but I notice you know, he, uh, 15 and 16 he says nobody can interpret now interesting what Joseph says same thing that Daniel says later Joseph answered the Pharaoh and said it is not in me God will give a favorable answer notice I can't interpret the dream I didn't interpret the earlier two but God is also you know what the word there for favorable is Shalom. So in other words, is Pharaoh kind of being a little distraught? And he's saying, God can give you peace, Pharaoh. Now whether Pharaoh wants to listen or not, it's another story. So notice he says, I can't do it, but God can. He's giving God the credit. By the way, does he say, I'll tell you if you get me out of this place? Now that's why you're going to see a difference in this chapter versus the last chapter. So he's then going to relate the two dreams to him. And we noted the two dreams. 
about the uh, the cows and and also the others. So he's going to relate it to him, and if he starts telling him the truth in verse twenty five. Pharaoh, the dreams are one and the same. God has told Pharaoh what he's about to do. You're going to have seven good years, abundant years, and then you're going to have seven years of famine. So he's telling him, 28, he just says, I've spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. It's interesting how he's telling him. Notice he's not taking any credit. He's just telling him. He says it's repeated in verse 32. Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. All right? So I'm telling you, Pharaoh, what is going to happen. Seven good years, seven tremendous famine years, and it's going to happen short. Notice what he says next. He's going to give him some uh, discernment, discerning advice. Now remember, you just, two hours ago, where were you? in the dungeon smelling and looking pretty bad and now you're telling the most powerful man what he should do? I mean, it's amazing. But notice what he says. He tells him four things that he ought to do. In verse 34, notice uh, verse 33, Now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and send him over all of Egypt and I'm the man. Is that what he said? He doesn't say anything about himself. Notice in 34, let him... And then also take action to appoint overseers in charge. So you're going to have one main person, then you're going to have people under him. Then he says, take 20% of the produce of these seven abundant years. And then in notice in 35, he said, you need to basically come up with granaries and have the granaries outside the large cities. So you have seven years to put up the granaries, put them outside the cities, have people over it, bring it in. T tax the people seven, 20% of bringing the stuff in. It's a good principle, too, when things are going well in our life, what should we do? Should we be produced, being prepared for the lean? So notice he does this, and notice it then is reserved, so when the famine comes, they're then ready. Notice then what happens in 37. So he tells him what the dream means, he tells him the four things he ought to do, and then notice in 37, now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. And then notice what you have, the discernment uh, decision of Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? Where do we find him? What does Joseph say? Nothing. That's amazing, isn't it? I've shown you all this stuff. If anybody ought to do it, it ought to be me. Joseph doesn't promote himself one bit. That's why I said the dross was removed. Before he was saying what? I deserve I'm in here wrongly. I need to get out. He doesn't say anything about the fact that he ought to be getting out and he's in there wrongly. If God wants me out, he'll get me out. Totally different than you've seen. It took two full years but now he's ready. So think about it when you have this. So notice then 39. Pharaoh makes an intelligent decision. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you are. Okay, so obviously Joseph chooses, okay, Pharaoh chooses Joseph. Now think about it. In one day's time, you're going from where? From prison to being the second over the most powerful nation of the world. But how, how did you get there? Who promoted you and who prepared you? In the right time, God will promote, but we have to do our part and get the dross and everything else taken out. It's interesting when he does it then, he puts him in charge, he gives him the signet ring, and notice then what he does. Now 45, again, I think it's an interesting part when you have it. He's riding in a chariot. Now why don't you think about this for a minute. And here you have Pharaoh going in the first chariot, and then you have Joseph in the second chariot. And are people bowing down to him? Now, if you're out in the uh, audience talking about this is coming by, how many of these wise men do you think are jealous and everything else? What is this slave foreigner doing second in command? I've served Pharaoh for how long? And this upstart just can only tell one little dream. And he's the second. There's going to be all kinds of opposition. It's amazing how many times you and I don't know the whole truth and what took place for the last 13 years, do we? 
How many times do we make wrong judgments about what God is doing things and placing people that we think we should have? We don't know what God's doing in that person's life and how he's prepared it. But God did the preparing of it. Uh, it's also interesting in 45 that he is now given a wife and she is the daughter of a priest. Can you imagine? Here you have a priest of a pagan god who's now the wife of Joseph. And Joseph asks for it. Joseph chooses it. Again, it's amazing how things take place. So notice then what happens in 46 then. So here we have the dreams. He's now been promoted. Joseph, 30 years when he stood before Pharaoh and went out in the presence, you notice what he does. He goes throughout all the land. Why is he going throughout all the land? Where are we going to build the granaries? Who am I going to put in charge? Because does he know the good overseers to get? Does, does he have to find it? And do you think he's going to rely on God to help find it? Notice what's interesting when he does it. Through the years, seven years of plenty, the land brought forth abundance. Notice what's interesting in 48. I don't know if you caught this before. Joseph stored up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond. And in 48, he gathered all the food seven good years and placed the food in the cities. He placed in every city the food from what? Surrounding fields. Why would that be important? How many of you are going to be, if you know it, they're taking food from around Owasso and putting it here. So when you need food, where do you go? You're getting food from where you raised yourself, and you're not going to get it back. He's not taking your food here and sending it down somewhere else. Each place is being brought food at the local place. Again, but again, that's why he's a discerning wise man. He does this in the granaries. And can you imagine while this is taking place, you're building granaries? How many times have they had granaries in the past? If they had them, they wouldn't be building them. Because there's a famine coming. Nobody can predict what's going to happen. Hey, we've had another good abundance here. What do we take and give them 20%? Six years of abundance. Why are we putting my stuff away? How well did Joseph believe in God and the dream? His entire reputation was based on what? God's truth. Is our entire reputation based on God's truth? It should be. So here he has it, and he does it, and he stores it. And I think it's interesting that it happens exactly as he says it's going to happen, and uh, everything takes place. So the question is then, am I willing to wait for God's will, God's way, and God's time? Did it work out like it should? Did Joseph say anything to Pharaoh about, I'm placed here wrongly? after he told him the truth and he basically emptied his hand he had no bargaining ship left did he? no bargaining ship to get out of prison no bargaining ship with which to be placed second in command but he gave God's message exactly with no strings attached and God when you want me out you want to change it you'll change it until then I'm going to be faithful where you post the dross was removed. He was ready. Think about it in the second one. But anyway, how many of us are willing to say, am I willing to be God's messenger to tell the whole truth all the time in any way? Do I do my work heartily unto the Lord no matter what is going on or where it is? Did he do it in Potiphar's house? Did he do it in prison? Did he do it for Pharaoh? He was the same for all three of them. Let me ask you another one. Am I willing to wait for God's time and do it God's way? How many of you ever jumped ahead of the gun and tried to do it your way? How many of you ever done it not only your way, but in your time? Even though it was the right thing, but it was the wrong time. How about am I willing to stack up my reputation, my entire reputation on God's way? Was it your dream? No. But it was God's interpretation. And are we willing to put everything we believe in, everything, our entire reputation, based on the Word of God and God's truth? Joseph was. Joseph was. Joseph was. Joseph was. 